Okay, thanks, Linda. I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, Growing Concerns for April the 30th. I'm uh, uh, going to uh, start off today with a bit of a crops update. We're going to look a little bit at uh, soil temperature and moisture conditions uh, in, the, uh, in the area. Uh, then we have uh, uh, John Goblowski here today, and John's going to give us a little bit of an update on some of the spring insects that we uh, could be or are should be watching out for and maybe some issues that we might be running into this spring. And then we'll uh, end off the, uh, the webinar today with uh, a few uh, slides and our information on spring burnoff and uh, what producers should be looking at when they're uh, going out and doing spring burnoff this year as to, uh, I guess our, our timeline is going to be uh, fairly tight this year and I think it's going to be something that we're going to be needing to keep, uh, keep on top of. For today, uh, we have uh, CCA credits for crop management, uh, one credit, and then if uh, you're in the CEU or CCSC credits, it's uh, half a credit for crop management and half a credit for integrated pest management. So this is what uh, I was doing some traveling the last few days, and uh, this is what uh, the ground looked like on April the 28th in the Rossman Shore Lake, and you've probably been getting, uh, or you've been probably hearing a lot of the uh, stuff on the news about the Rossburn Bertle area over the last few days. So uh, as of uh, April the 28th, this is what what the morning looked like in that area, and then the next day, this is where water levels came up in certain areas. Uh, a lot of roads were being closed, and then as you get closer to the Burkell Valley, definitely the situation getting a, getting a lot worse than this. So I think the biggest thing that happened there is a lot of that snow that we uh, we had north uh, melted really fast, and a lot of the culverts either were still frozen or couldn't handle all the water coming at one time, so we got a lot of water backing up, and uh, I think that created the majority of the problem. Uh, it seemed like it was cold, 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 and then all of a sudden we got a few days of warm weather and it didn't take long for that snow to go and then we had some rain that definitely helped get rid of all that snow. So the last few days I've been uh, trying to you know determine what soil uh, soil temperatures are because I think uh, as uh, as the weather starts changing your guys are going to want to get going fairly quickly and uh, took this uh, yesterday morning and uh, You'd see the soil temperature in the morning was uh, about plus one to plus two, and uh, it was minus one during the evening that night. So the ground was fairly firm. So uh, you know, evening to uh, first thing in the morning, the ground temperature was fairly cold. Yesterday afternoon, I took this uh, this one when you finished a plus ten degree day, and uh, again, both of these were done in canola stubble, and uh, this one was uh, in that you know, right around that plus uh, plus nine degrees uh, Celsius. I guess one of the things I wanted to um, I just mention and I wanted to show with those two slides is that when you're trying to determine your soil temperature, it's not the best to go in the morning to do it or, or the best to do like this slide is where I went in the afternoon and took it because if you have the whole heat, the heat of the day warming up the, the top surface, you're definitely going to have uh, the soil warm up, but uh, when it cools off during the evening, the temperature is going to go down again. So the best thing to do would probably be is to do an average. So if you took that plus one and plus nine, you got ten, and if you divide that by two, you're looking at about five five degrees Celsius uh, is what uh, what the soil temperature is at approximately right about now. And when you look at uh, the latest uh, information from the um, from our weather sites, uh, the one in the southwest here, and you look at the last few days regarding soil temperature, uh, we're probably in that zero to most of the areas are reporting in that zero to plus five degrees Celsius range for uh, for soil temperature. So um, not too far off with the method that uh, we, we worked out or was doing the last couple days here. So soil temperatures are starting to warm up, uh, still a little bit on the cool side. Uh, um, one of the other things I wanted to mention is uh, in the past, um, one of the things uh, we've done is we've actually tried to do uh, lie the thermometer down, like dig down about a, an inch to where you're going to put the seed and uh, lie the thermometer down and then cover it up again and see what the soil temperature is that way. It seems to 
maybe give a little bit more accurate uh, uh, reading than just having it standing up uh, out of the soil. So with that, we're going to get a lot of questions of uh, what do you plan first, and I thought I'd throw together a few slides as to what crops might be the ones to look at uh, if, you're, if they're in your planting intentions this year as to uh, which ones to start with and which ones to maybe leave a little bit longer. Um, peas, uh, and I guess we all probably know that peas are quite cold tolerant and they can uh, be planted when the soil temperature averages around 5 degrees Celsius, so we're right in that area right now. So as long as the, the ground was firm enough to travel on, I would imagine a lot of producers would be out there planting their peas if, uh, if you're, you have that in your, in your crop rotation. One of the things about peas is they can germinate at a lower temperature because it takes them a little bit longer to absorb moisture, and because of that, uh, they, uh, they just need more time to absorb the moisture to get going. So they, the, the cold or the cold fluctuations in the soil and the, and the soil water uh, aren't as uh, severe as uh, on peas as they would be on, say, something like soybeans. So peas are definitely one that could are, are ones that could go in right away. After peas, uh, you know, cereal crops such as wheat and barley are also quite cold tolerant and be, and be you know, seeded anywhere from about four to five degrees Celsius. So again, we're right in that that area where if the ground was dry enough to travel on, we could probably be getting that in the ground. Some of the crops also, because uh, they're a little longer maturing, it wouldn't hurt to get out there as quick as you can to get them in. So if you're growing some of the CPSs or the CPS white wheats, they tend to be a little bit longer maturing and to take advantage of their full yield potential, it'd be good to get out there and get them in as quick as you can. So your CPSs and then your hard reds would be uh, in, you know, something to look at and then, you know, and probably your wheats and barleys can go in at the same time. I guess one of the things about cereal crops and planting them early is that the growing point for cereal crops such, you know, wheat, barley, oats, uh, the, uh, the growing point uh, stays below uh, the soil surface uh, if for, uh, until it gets into that three to, three to three leaf stage. You know, so we've got a fair bit of time for the soil to warm up and conditions outside to warm up before that plant has any risk of doing any major damage from uh, spring frost. So, uh, uh, you know, there's a crop there that we can definitely get in the ground early and get it off and going. Canola and flax, there's going to be a lot of canola and flax going in this year. And we always promote to get your canola in early and your flax in early so it's not flowering during that hot time during the summer and because usually when that happens you get flower aborting and lowering of yield. However, you do have to be uh, aware that uh, a lot of those, uh, those plants when they're in the seeding stage uh, need to get past the two to three leaf stage sort of thing before they're hard enough to, to handle a, a spring frost. So we've been caught a couple times the last couple of years where guys have got canola in a little bit too early, or I shouldn't say too early, but got it in early and what's happened is we've gotten uh, a spring frost and then uh, they've had to go out either and reassess their stands or go back in and even do some replanting. Another thing to remember when you're planting canola is your seed treatment. And you've got to remember that uh, a lot of those seed treatments are there. Their longevity is starts the day you put the seed in the ground. So if, uh, if the ground or the seed sits, seed sits in the ground for any length of time, you're losing flea beetle control. And that's something we've, uh, we've seen over the last couple of years where canola sat in the ground for you know, up to two weeks before it's come through the ground. And then we've had infestations of flea beetles coming in and we've had, uh, had issues with, uh, with control. So I'm sure John's going to talk, maybe talk a little bit about that as we uh, go on in the webinar today. I guess with, uh, with canola and flax, uh, research, research has shown that uh, uh, both of them will germinate anywhere from 2 to 4 degrees Celsius. So I don't think we have to worry about the soil temperature being warm enough right now to get it going. I just think right, uh, what we need to be a little bit concerned about is the uh, it'll germinate, but it's going to be growing slow. What we, want, what we really want with canola and flax is it to uh, germinate and get out of the ground as fast as it can 
and then they start throwing out leaves so we can you know get away from some of the pressures of uh, of insect damage and then soybeans uh, soybeans are one of the ones that uh, we're going to be planting a lot of again in the southwest and you know, some of the time that they say is the best time to plant soybeans is any time between the 15th to the 25th of May or when this uh, average soil temperature is warm to at least 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, you know, 18 to 22 they say is ideal, but, you know, I'm thinking for, uh, for us this year that 10 degrees Celsius is something we should be, uh, be watching for and looking for. One of the things you have to remember with soybeans is that you can, uh, the cool soils and the cool soil moisture can uh, really affect germination plant size and plant health. So if you plant it in cool soil uh, and moist, uh, like cool moisture in the soil, that plant in the first uh, 24 hours absorbs a lot of that moisture and, or that seed and that could have some, uh, uh, some bad effects on, on the, the remainder of growth of that plant, whether it be the germination of that seed, even just the whole uh, plant size and whole health of it going throughout the growing season. So uh, that's something definitely to be watching for, and I think as we learn more about growing soybeans, we're going to be uh, watching that issue. Seedlings can tolerate a light frost for soybeans, so I think uh, you know we'll, we we should be okay if we're, or hopefully we'll be okay if we're planting when the soil is at around the 10 degrees Celsius. However, if uh, they do get frost damages, a lot of time as seedlings they do not recover, so we need to be aware of that as well and, and hoping we don't get a frost towards the end of May, uh, you know, first week of June. The other thing with soybeans, the longer we do leave them uh, for planting, we seem to be seeing that the plants uh, have decreased height and uh, with decreased height you get lower pods to the ground and with lower pods to the ground a lot of times we're not doing a great job on harvesting so our yields are reduced. So. I guess uh, with, uh, with, with, with just those few slides, uh, really, you know, if you're sowing peas, that would be one of the first things to get out and do. Get your cereals, uh, get your canola in once, uh, once we're after that, and then go into your soybeans. So um, I guess uh, with that, I think uh, we're going to, if, as, well, first I'll check and see if Linda, is there any questions? Uh, no, I don't have any questions right now. Okay, well then I think what we'll do is we'll hit into John's presentation on spring insect update and uh, go from there. Hello. Okay, John, if you okay, go ahead and, can... yeah, we can see your screen, so go ahead. Okay, awesome. Okay, uh, so what I'm going to go over today are a few of the early season insects that we'll encounter. Um, first one on my list, grasshoppers, isn't something that's really an early season insect problem so much, but uh, something we should probably be looking for and scouting for early in the season. So I've picked four insects to cover, uh, grasshoppers, flea beetles, cutworms, and wireworms. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about their uh, early season biology, scouting damage, uh, and hopefully some of the science that will help you in your decision making, but I do encourage you. Uh, if you have any questions on things I'm not covering, please send in your questions and we'll try to get them answered. So I'll start with grasshoppers. Uh, grasshoppers normally don't go from low levels to higher or outbreak levels in a year or two. It usually takes a few years of good conditions to build their populations up. And what we've seen over the last two years is uh, a gradual increase in populations for two consecutive years. Uh, you'll recall back in uh, 2011, uh, 2010 and 11 populations were very low. Uh, 2012 they started to come back a little bit and in 2013 last year uh, we did see quite an increase in populations to the point where I know early on people were doing some uh, control around field edges and there were some fields being sprayed. So uh, if we get another hot, drier summer, we could be looking at some situations where, at least locally, people are needing to control grasshoppers. So this is certainly one that we want to watch for this year and keep an eye on, just because we have had some building populations. Now one of the things that regulates grasshoppers uh, quite heavily is weather. and uh, 
there's a few different things that can kill grasshoppers uh, weather-wise. Uh, as far as winter kill goes, we, we very rarely lose a significant part of the population because of cold winter temperatures. It can happen, but really what you need for that to happen is a year where you have very little snowfall and very cold temperatures. And I think with the snowfall that we had uh, in most areas this year, I wouldn't count on there being high winter kill. Uh, it, you need to get uh, down to about minus 15 degrees in the soil where the eggs are to get substantial winter kill. And keep in mind that grasshoppers, when they're laying eggs in the fall, in the late summer and fall, they often move to areas that have lush green vegetation, which often includes roadsides, uh, ditches, areas where you do get a lot of snow accumulation. So even though we did have a fairly cold winter, there probably was enough snow in a lot of their uh, egg laying areas that I wouldn't count on there being heavy winter kill. Uh, some of the eggs that may have got laid right in the field may have not survived as well. Uh, but again, grasshoppers don't usually lay a lot of eggs inside a field that uh, doesn't have a lot of lush green vegetation. They're often moving to uh, ditches, field edges. So uh, do keep an eye on those areas. Uh, starting in about early June, you want to be scouting those areas for grasshoppers. Uh, as far as spring weather and especially wet weather, one of the things I like to stress is the heavy rains in spring can kill grasshoppers, but the, the timeliness of them is important. Uh, rains that we get in April and through much of May will do next to nothing to grasshoppers. Uh, the grasshopper eggs are coated in uh, a pretty much waterproof shell. A colleague of mine in Alberta one year, he took uh, some grasshopper egg pods from one of our pest species and he put them in a glass of water for a week, poured the water out and the eggs hatched. So don't count on heavy rains in April and May. Uh, if you have flooded areas of your fields and your ditches, don't count on that killing the grasshopper eggs. They can survive those conditions quite well. What can hurt grasshoppers is lots of rain, especially in early and mid-June when the eggs are hatching. Uh, once the eggs hatch, those, the, the juveniles, they're about the size of a, a, a wheat kernel, they're very susceptible to excess moisture at that stage. So it's heavy rains, mainly in, in early and uh, mid-June, that can really take the population down. And persistent rains and damp weather throughout the summer can get a, a fungus going in the population, and that can hurt them as well. So again, timeliness of the rains is what's really important. Uh, if we do get, uh, as mentioned earlier, a uh, hot, uh, dry spring and summer, that can get the grasshoppers going a bit earlier. Uh, there's less lush vegetation in the ditches and things for them, so they move into your crops a bit earlier. And those are usually the conditions where grasshoppers become more of an issue. So uh, a big part of what might happen this year uh, does depend on the weather that we're likely to get. Uh, and as well, uh, just to uh, finish up the, the cycle here for uh, effects of weather, uh, a warm extended fall does a couple things. It allows our pest species to lay their eggs a bit longer, and it also gets a little bit of development going in those eggs. The embryo starts developing, and so a hatch comes a bit quicker the next year. So. Uh, not only a warm, dry spring and summer, but if you get a warm extended fall with the first frost coming late, that can enhance the number of eggs that are in the ground and their development, so that uh, can increase the risk for the next year. And so what's on the screen now is a, a grasshopper forecast map, and this map is based on counts that we do in August. Essentially, it's a snapshot of the egg-laying population that's there, and what we try to do is um, use this data and also factor in some of the weather conditions that were experienced when they were laying their eggs and predict what might happen the next season. Uh, so you can see the southwest, uh, there is a lot of areas that are getting into that moderate uh, risk range. Um, however, as I mentioned, we do need to factor in the weather 
uh, in spite of a lot of the map being either lighter risk or moderate risk, we did have very good egg laying conditions uh, of a later fall, uh, fairly warm and dry conditions for egg laying, which probably would allow our pest species to uh, lay their maximum number of eggs or close to it. So in spite of the map maybe not showing a lot of red or orange, uh, I would say still consider grasshoppers one of your, uh, probably your, one of your top insect concerns going into the season. And do get out there in early June, scout your ditches, uh, any areas that you know based on experience are areas that tend to have a lot of hatch early on. I scout those areas, see what the populations are like. And the main message I have regarding grasshoppers is, is if control is likely to be needed, don't wait too long. Uh, as a general rule, I like to suggest that as soon as you start seeing wing buds on the grasshoppers, that's a good time to be doing control if the population is very high. Uh, if the grasshoppers are still quite small, no wing buds present yet, there's probably still a lot more eggs to hatch. But once you start seeing wing buds, it's a good time. Uh, if you wait too long and you get adult grasshoppers with fully developed wings, they won't be concentrated in your uh, field edges along your ditches. They'll be moving into the fields, and control becomes a lot more difficult and more expensive. So early on is good. Um, this picture here was actually taken near Cirrus uh, a couple years ago. Uh, a grasshopper clinging to a canola pod upside down, dead grasshopper. This one's infected by a fungus called Entomophagus grilli. This is the fungus that I was mentioning. If you get uh, a couple weeks of really damp conditions over the summer, uh, sometimes this fungus will get going. And if you do see a lot of grasshoppers, or you recall last year seeing a lot of dead grasshoppers clinging to the top of the plants, uh, that's because they've got this fungus. The fungus makes them climb the plants and kind of die clinging to the top of the plant. And it kind of helps the fungus spread because eventually this grasshopper will fill up with spores. The cuticle of the grasshopper splits open because of the pressure, and the spores get released uh, throughout the canopy, infecting other grasshoppers. So that's a good sign if you saw a lot of that. It might mean that the fungus was active, and that will take out at least some portion of the population. Uh, regarding control measures, um, a lot of the RMs in their grasshopper control programs use the Eco brand. Uh, it works well in situations where they're concentrated around a field edge or a ditch or something because it's easy to apply to an area like that. Uh, it is a, a bait, so it can't be sprayed on. It's applied either with a special spreader or even something like a Valma that spreads granular fertilizer you could apply this with. It, basically, it's um, a brand bait that contains carbaryl or seven and uh, there's an attractant in there to draw the grasshoppers to the bait. They eat it. If they're young grasshoppers, one flake will kill them. If they're an adult, it would probably take about four or five flakes. So it works better on young grasshoppers early on. Regarding sprays, uh, nothing too much new to report. However, uh, in the last uh, few weeks, uh, Corrigan went through a bit of a label expansion. And one of the things that the label was expanded to include is grasshoppers in cereal crops and forage and pasture grasses. So uh, that might be an option for some. Uh, Corrigin is probably a bit pricier than Matador or Desist or something like that. It'll cost you a little bit more. It does have good residual, though, and it is somewhat selective. It's great on grasshoppers and uh, caterpillars and certain beetles, but the insects have to eat the foliage to get killed by it. So it, uh, is much less harmful to parasitic wasps and a lot of the natural enemies. And it's also um, not that harmful to people and humans and, um, and mammals as well. So lower mammalian toxicity. So it's got a few um, virtues that might make it uh, a, a good consideration for grasshopper control in the crops that it's registered for. And that's not in your guide to crop protection right now. It will be in the addendum because that was just a very new registration. Uh, flea beetles, uh, this is another insect I would say to be watching for for this year. Uh, if I had to rank my top two concerns early on, I would say grasshoppers and flea beetles. Uh, we did have some quite high populations late last season. Uh, what was interesting 
last year when I was looking at the species that were present late, uh, a lot of it was crucifer flea beetle. Uh, earlier in the season, we did see quite a few striped. And late, it was mainly all crucifer, it seems. The picture that you see, there's two different species in the picture. At the uh, top of the picture, at the top of the cod leading, are two striped flea beetles. Down lower is a crucifer flea beetle. And although we almost generically term them all flea beetles, uh, they, they, there is slight differences between them. Uh, one difference is not all the uh, seed treatments work equally well on the different species of flea beetles. Uh, I'm just going to go to my next slide here to explain things a bit. Uh, so in, in canola in Manitoba, there's actually about 10 different species of, of flea beetles that can be on canola, but only two that we really commonly see. The other eight, you'll find them occasionally, but they're more rare. The two that we commonly see are the striped and the crucifer flea beetle. And Biologically, they're a little different. The striped flea beetle, so the one on the uh, left-hand side of your screen, it comes out much earlier than the crucifer flea beetle. So I wouldn't be surprised if, as soon as the temperature hits about 14 degrees, I wouldn't be surprised if you started to see a few striped flea beetles. Uh, 14 degrees is kind of the base temperature where actually both of these species will start flying. The crucifer flea, oh, sorry, the striped flea beetle though, usually comes out a bit earlier. So usually late April, uh, early May, most of the population is striped flea beetle. And then starting about mid-May, you'll start seeing more crucifer flea beetles. And by late May into June, it's mainly crucifer flea beetles. Now, the neonicotinoid insecticides work much better on the crucifer flea beetle than the striped flea beetle. And it's not resistance. I know I've heard uh, people claiming that there's resistance by the striped flea beetle to some of the seed treatments like Helix and Prosper, and that's not true. It's not resistance. A resistance means there was a genetic change that occurred in the insects to make them not be killed by the product, and that's not what has occurred here. Uh, the striped flea beetle is, and, and has always been, just a little bit more resistant to the chemicals than the striped flea, than the crucifer flea beetle. It doesn't mean that they're not killed by it. They're not killed in the same numbers, though, and it takes a bit longer. So you do see a bit poorer control if the majority of the population is striped flea beetles. So when you're trying to figure out why your seed treatment may have not given you the control you expected, one of the things to consider is the species of flea beetle that might have been present, as well as the weather conditions, which I'll get to in a second. Um, one of the questions I've been getting a lot over the winter is about Lumiderm. Uh, Lumiderm is another seed treatment that you can add to your canola. Uh, at this point, you can't get Lumiderm on its own on canola seed. You're purchasing it with Helix or Prosper or Gaucho or one of the uh, standard seed treatments. In fact, I think it's just Helix and Prosper right now that it's uh, available with as an option. Uh, so people have been asking, so uh, is it worth the extra investment? It, it'll cost you more to be including Lumiderm in your seed treatment package. So the question is, are you going to get uh, enough benefit for that extra cost to make it worthwhile? So a few things to consider if you're making that decision. Uh, one is that Lumiderm does work quite well on cutworms, whereas uh, Helix and Prosper really don't. So if you have had some chronic cutworm problems in, in your area, uh, Lumiderm will provide control of the cutworms. And regarding the flea beetles, uh, Lumiderm will provide control of striped flea beetles uh, much better than uh, Helix or Prosper alone would. So you will get some enhanced control of striped flea beetle. So again, depending on what the dominant species seems to be in your area, if it um, is predominantly striped flea beetle, the Lumiderm would help with the flea beetle control. If it's predominantly crucifer flea beetle, you might not see much difference. Now the other uh, thing that is important to realize whether you're using Helix or Prosper alone or you've got Lumiderm in there is none of these seed treatments work as well in cool, wet conditions as they do in warmer, drier conditions. Uh, part of it's due to the solubility of the products. Uh, Bob Elliott uh, in, with Agriculture Canada in Saskatoon, uh, he's been doing a lot of research to study this 
Uh, so uh, it's based on his data that I'm making this comment. But the neonicotinoid seed treatments uh, tend to be more effective in drier soils than wet soils and more effective when you're in uh, conditions of 20 to 30 degrees than if you're down around 10 degrees. And this statement does apply to Lumiderm as well. So if by chance you seed and we get some cool wet conditions, the products aren't going to work as well and your plants are growing slower as well. Lionel uh, alluded to this earlier. The, the crop just isn't growing that quickly. Uh, so you do run the risk of the seed treatment essentially wearing out before the flea beetles, uh, before the plants have gotten large enough to be resistant to the flea beetles. So particularly if we get a cool, wet spring, uh, do keep an eye on that canola. Uh, do some scouting. We, we have seen situations where foliar sprays are needed in addition to the seed treatments. And we've even gotten into situations where people have had to reseed. So keep an eye on things. Uh, don't make too many assumptions. And if by chance uh, you are starting to see a lot of seeding on the cotyledons, uh, we always encourage people, uh, scout. Don't get too alarmed if you're in a situation like this here where you have, say, 10%. Uh, even when the seed treatments are working, there's going to be some pitting of the cotyledons. So in a situation like this where you've got a few pits starting to show, that's really not a, um, a reason to spray. Uh, the plants can compensate for this feeding quite nicely. Now, once you start getting between about 20 and 30 uh, percent pitting of your cotyledons, that's what we consider the economic threshold. Uh, it's a nominal threshold. It's hard to back it with science, but based on experience, this seems to be the area where uh, a spray decision starts to make sense if there's a lot of heavy flea beetle pressure still. Uh, uh, truly, the economic uh, threshold or economic injury level is probably closer to 50 percent, but the problem is flea beetles can damage the crop so quickly. Uh, you can go from 25 to 50 very quickly within a, a couple of days easily if the flea beetle pressure is high. So that's why we kind of suggest use 25 percent as a guideline for an economic threshold. Uh, as far as other things that might help provide some flea beetle control, anything that gets the crop uh, going early and uh, gets it through those early stages, the cod laden stage and the first couple true leaf stages early is good. So if possible, uh, seeding uh, shallow and uh, if you've got the moisture to be able to do that it can help. Uh, direct seeding for people who are using uh, reduced tillage or minimum tillage, that can help. Uh, flea beetles do like a more exposed, sunnier, warmer uh, habitat. So uh, they do prefer fields that are more open than fields that have a lot of stubble in them. Uh, Lloyd Dawson in Alberta did a lot of research on this and uh, found that there can be quite a difference in flea beetle populations between uh, Minim, minimally tilled fields and fields with more conventional tillage. And increasing seeding rates, I know with the cost of canola seed, that's not always a, an option, but basically you're diluting out the damage by having uh, more canola seedlings growing, so you may find that there's less feeding per plant if that's an option to be doing. Uh, cutworms. Uh, I mentioned them briefly talking about Lumiderm. One of the things that you should keep in mind regarding cutworms is uh, we have different types of cutworms. They're not all alike in their biology and the way they damage your crops. So sometimes it's good to know what you're dealing with. The two that we normally see the most of in Manitoba, or at least we have seen the most of in the past few years, are red-backed and dingy cutworm, the ones you see in the picture here. Uh, on the right-hand side of your screen is a dingy cutworm. And this one is probably an easier one for you to recognize because if you look carefully at the back, they look to have, um, it almost looks like a series of tire tracks or Vs going down the back. And especially when they get bigger, it's easy to see that. That's quite characteristic of dingy cutworm. Dingy cutworm overwinters as a partially grown larva. So uh, as soon as the soil warms up, they're already larva actively waiting to feed. So they will be feeding on the crops quite early in the season. Uh, they don't do a lot of clipping. They 
more more often what they do is they come out of the, the ground at night and they will take chunks out of your cotyledons and uh, early true leaves of your plant and uh, go back in the ground during the day. But again, they don't do a lot of clipping. So it kind of baffles people. They'll be scouting their wheat or canola or whatever it is that's in the field and they'll see chunks gone out of leaves but it's too early for grasshoppers and they're not seeing any. You don't have the, the clipped plant, so people aren't cluing in that it's cutworms. Uh, if you run into that situation, do a little bit of digging around the damaged plants and see if by chance it's dingy cutworm. Because again, they don't leave the telltale sign of a clipped plant to um, help people make the connection that it's cutworms doing the feeding. Redback cutworm, on the other hand, is a species that does a lot of clipping. Uh, one of the differences, though, with redback cutworm, they overwinter as an egg. So right now, they're mainly still eggs. They'll be hatching out really soon, but they, they will be very tiny. Uh, they'll be smaller than dingy cutworm early on, not doing as much damage. So they're more of an insect that we uh, see a lot of or get complaints of in late May and some years right throughout June. So they're a bit of a later species. Again, they do do a lot of clipping when they get bigger, so you get those telltale clipped plants lying on the soil. That helps people clue in that there's cutworms present. Uh, they're an easier one to recognize as well because if you look carefully, especially on the bigger larvae, you'll see two red lines that go down the back, kind of divided by uh, this darker line with some white in the middle. So you've got these two red lines, that's redback cutworm. Um, next to the redback cutworm here, I've shown two pupa. Uh, if you get to the stage where you're starting to dig up pupa as well as the larva, uh, it's too late to be doing control. They've done their feeding and any control at that point is just revenge spraying. Uh, and all the cutworms are moths as adults. This is a redback cutworm moth in the picture here. Uh, a couple notes if you're um, finding cutworms. They can be patchy. They can be very patchy, in fact, in fields. Uh, often when they're laying their eggs in August and early September, they're drawn to areas of a field that might have some uh, flowering vegetation. So it could be some later crop. It could be a weed patch. Uh, often things can be very patchy. And they don't like particularly wet soil. They prefer soil that's a little bit drier. So sometimes you will find more of them uh, on a ridge rather than a lower part of the field. So things can be patchy. Sometimes patch spring is all you need to do uh, to assess the situation. And certainly for cutworms, evening spring is best because they're in the soil during the day. Um, just a, another note too, uh, there's somebody at the University of Manitoba doing a study on parasitoids of cutworms. So if you have a field with a lot of cutworms uh, and you don't mind the cutworms, being part of a scientific study, you could uh, give myself a call or uh, or Lionel or one of the FPAs, and um, they'll probably contact myself. I'll try to get a sample, or we'll send somebody from the university to collect, or you can collect a sample yourself and uh, try to get it to us, and we'd make them part of the study. But what we're trying to do essentially is rear them out and see what wasps pop out of them and know what the parasitoids are that are in our local species. And wire worms, uh, another insect to be looking for early. Um, wire worms are quite different than cutworms, actually, in appearance and in what they do. So the picture on your left is a couple of wire worms. Uh, one of the differences between wire worms and cutworms, wire worms are a beetle larva. So they're not a moth larva. They don't have the fleshy pro legs at the back. They've got three small pair of legs at the front. And with wire worms, they're more uh, long, uh, they're very kind of a hard, wiry texture to them, which is why they get their name wire worms. So appearance-wise, they are quite different. Um, one of the differences behaviorally, wire worms don't come above the soil to feed. Cutworms often do. So with wire worms, the feeding is primarily all below ground, uh, often on seeds that maybe haven't even germinated yet or are just starting to germinate. Uh, they will feed on the portion of plant that is above the seed but below the soil still. So they're essentially killing the plant or the new growth that you would see come up is somewhat shredded because of their feeding. 
so because of that, again, they will kill a lot of plants that they're feeding on, and you get bare patches. So another thing you need to be looking for. Now, uh, with wireworms, one of the difficulties is you can't just spray something on the field to kill them. Nothing will work. They're in the soil. It's hard to get chemical down to them. The only way you can really manage them is with seed treatments. So if you do have fields that you know uh, chronically have had some wireworm problems, uh, that's a situation where a seed treatment with an insecticide on it might make sense. Uh, not all fields are going to be at high risk. You probably know based on experience the ones that are at a bit higher risk. Um, so you, you do have to use a seed treatment in advance. And the other thing to keep in mind, uh, wireworms, uh, depending on the species, can have a life cycle anywhere from about two to four years as a larva in the soil before they become the adult beetle. So if you had wireworms in a field last year, even if you did have a seed treatment, say, cruiser or um, stress shield from Bayer, one of the seed treatments that uh, re reduces wireworm feeding you potentially still will have wireworms this year. The seed treatments that are, are currently available essentially make the wireworms sick um, while the plants are young. So the wireworms aren't feeding when the plants are young. The plants get off to good start, but the wireworms don't necessarily die. Only a, a very small portion will. So even if you did have a field that, say, had cruiser in it last year, uh, you still may have wireworms there this year. So again. Uh, base those seed treatment decisions on what you know historically of damage in those fields. And not every field is going to need one of these seed treatments. Uh, another thing just to bring to your attention, uh, not everything that is a long worm-like thing in the field is a wireworm. So on your left in the, on the screen, these are wireworms. On the right, this is a, a fly larva. They're called cerebids. And they can be quite common in the fields in some years. Uh, they're actually predators. They're very quick. And one of the ways you'll know it's not a wireworm is if you were to disturb or pick up one of these three, but they go snaky. They start squirming vigorously. They're very quick. Uh, like I said, uh, move very rapidly when disturbed. They don't have any legs at all, whereas the wireworms do have uh, a, a few pair of legs up near the front. And again, these are predators. They don't do any damage to crops. So if they're more of a pale white color, um, no legs on them, and they move quickly, they're not wireworms. They're thrivids, and they're good guys. They're, they, in fact, they will feed on wireworms. So you want to leave them. Uh, the other thing, just to bring to your attention, is there is a wireworm survey being conducted once again. Uh, Bob Vernon in Aggie CBC is the one who coordinates this. The farm production advisors, uh, so Lionel, um, Amir, and uh, uh, Almer, they're all involved in this uh, to some degree. What uh, they will be doing is putting out uh, baited traps to try to collect wireworms and get them sent in to the survey. Uh, I would encourage you, if you have any fields that you think might have high wireworm populations, or you do find uh, spots that do have wireworms, uh, call one of the farm production advisors, let them know. Uh, I'm sure they would be quite interested in coming and collecting from the area or putting a bait in the field to collect them uh, to be part of the survey. So uh, let us know if you are finding wireworms. We can get them into the survey. And why it's good to get them in, uh, one of my slides earlier mentioned that we do have lots of different species of wireworms. There's about 30 species that can be pests in Canada. And we do know what our two most common ones are in Manitoba, but we're still trying to find out more about our population. Because one of the things that they're finding uh, in the research that's being done in BC is for the, the neonicotinoid seed treatments, they don't work equally well against all species of wireworms. So it's good if we know what our dominant species are. It might help us uh, figure out how well the seed treatments might work. And it, it also might give us some other information that can be helpful in knowing how to manage wireworms and um, what factors might put them at uh, being a greater risk. So good to get those samples in if you are finding wireworms. So uh, it, if you do find some, uh, you come across them in the field and you want to get them sent in, uh, it's best to have them sent in live. All you got to do is put them in a container with a bit of soil. And on the container, just 
uh, make sure there's a note that includes the dates that they were collected, uh, certainly the crop that was in the field. Uh, Bob mentioned if you can indicate what the soil type is, that can be helpful too. And you can get them to either myself or one of the farm production advisors. And the farm production advisors all know how to get these sent in for the survey. So uh, we can make sure they get to where they need to go. So maybe what I should do is end with that. And certainly if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Um, I don't have any questions at this time. Uh, Lionel, did you have any questions? Hi. Yeah, uh, John, uh, just a couple here. Uh, uh, regarding the, um, the fungus uh, or the disease that's affecting the grasshoppers last fall, we were seeing quite a few of them dead on top of the crops. Is that going to have any major effect on the population, or is that just uh, is that something that just happens? And you know, if we got is the number still going to be large, or is was that able to take out a large number? I guess the short answer is uh, potentially it can take out a large number. Historically, uh, there have been uh, years where it's been documented that the fungus did take a significant part of the population out. So the potential is there. But again, it depends on how prevalent the fungus is and what the level of infectivity is. And it, it can vary greatly from region to region. Uh, so it's a tough one to answer. It, it, is, it is possible to be seeing the odd grasshopper up on the plants and for it to have a neg negligible effect uh, if you get into a situation where you've got a very heavy population and say 5% uh, of them get infected, certainly that'll help somewhat, but you still could have a lot of egg laying going into the next season. So it really it depends on the proportion of the population that's affected by the fungus. Uh, the potential is there for it to be a, a very effective biocontrol. Uh, we had a very a fairly heavy population last year. It's hard to say. I wouldn't count on at this point, the population um, having crashed because of it. I would be looking. Uh, that being said, uh, again, historically, it, it, there have been some populations that have crashed as a result. There was a, a point where they were trying to commercialize this fungus and make it available as something that could be sprayed onto fields. Problem is, it, it's a very tricky thing to mass rear in a lab and make into a commercial product. It would be very expensive. Uh, so that research is kind of stalled, and uh, I, I don't think anyone's pursuing that. OK, and then uh, with the Lumiderm, uh, do you get any extended control when you use that product, or is that just beefing up control so you get cutworm? Uh, that's a tricky question, actually. Uh, I've seen about three different studies regarding the length of control with Lumiderm. And a couple of the studies conflict a little bit. Um, what you probably can expect is anywhere from, I'm going to say, three to five weeks for control. I know the um, advertising says 35 days. And it's probably fairly accurate. That's um, uh, consistent with what Bob Elliott's finding in his studies in Saskatoon and what some of the DuPont data shows. Uh, there was a study done at the University of Guelph that showed a little bit less control, but I think the reality is it probably depends on the environmental conditions. Uh, probably under uh, conditions ideal for the product, you probably can get up to five weeks. Uh, if by chance it's uh, cool, wet conditions, I wouldn't count on it being five weeks. So uh, it, it might extend things a little bit, probably not significantly. Uh, what it is doing is providing potential cutworm control and enhanced striped flea beetle control. But I wouldn't expect there to be uh, a greatly enhanced uh, length of control. OK. Great, John. Uh, that was a great presentation and give us uh, an update as to what to watch for for uh, insects for this coming year. Thanks again. With that, um, I'm going to uh, I guess talk a little bit about planning your spring burnoff. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, we are going to be getting into uh, seeding here hopefully in a week or so. And uh, with that, uh, I think it's going to be uh, a time where we're going to be running, trying to get the crop in as fast as we can. And 
one of the things that sometimes gets put to the side is a burn off and I think producers a lot of times pay for that because of not not getting it done or not getting it done at the proper time and uh, I, uh, I found this uh, from uh, some of Kristen's uh, Phillips's uh, uh, work uh, last year uh, with uh, showing a presentation regarding uh, uh, timing is everything when it comes to uh, weed control in your crop and when you look at the, the information showing here you definitely can see that weed emergence uh, during the seeding to crop emergence to the first one to two weeks is probably the most crucial time to get weed control done and has the most effect on, on your high yield production. So that burn off time period definitely has an effect as to when and uh, uh, and how you can increase uh, increase yields. So uh, just going to I guess talk a little bit more about things you should be aware of or things to uh, be watching for when you're getting out there and planning your uh, your spring burn off. One of the big things is uh, know what weeds are present because knowing what weeds are present are going to help you decide on what products uh, what product or products to use and uh, there's a lot of different products out there now and a lot of different top-ups so definitely know what weeds you're going after. Uh, make sure you know what you're also going after whether you're going after annuals, uh, perennials or biennials. Uh, those are also important because that'll, uh, that'll depend, that'll help you make a better decision as to what, uh, what products to use. The growth stage is important. Uh, we really need to be watching some of the, the crops or some of the volunteers to get going early in the spring. Uh, I think uh, with uh, the yields we had in canola last year, uh, there's some uh, pretty good potential for some, uh, some volunteer canola to be coming this spring and I think that's something that we're going to be uh, needing to keep a, a real good eye on. So growth stage is important for controlling some of these volunteer crops as well as some of the winter annuals and, and perennials. What rate or product to, uh, to use is also uh, going to be uh, something that you need to know because again uh, as, the, as the weed or gets, gets larger uh, your product is going to change and so is the rate you're going to need to use to get control of that, uh, that weed in your field. So a little bit about weed identification and Annuals, uh, you know, basically live for one year. Uh, we do have winter annuals and they'll germinate in the fall, so uh, they'll be the ones that are, are going to start growing really quick here once the weather warms up. Uh, biennials, uh, a plant that lives for two years, so it's one, again, that'll be uh, one that'll be going early in the spring. And perennials, uh, you know, la uh, weeds that are there all the time, you know, a good example would be something like a, a thistle or something, a like, uh, Canada thistle or, uh, or a dandelion. When you're picking your glyphosate formulation, uh, I guess one of the things to remember is we've had a lot of changes over the last four to five years with uh, glyphosate and it comes in several different forms, several different packaging and several different formulations. So make sure you know the product and you know the, uh, the concentration. We go from anywhere from 356 grams per liter to 540. We go from different formulations from a, uh, an IPA salt to a DMA salt and so just know what product you're using I guess is what I really want to show with this slide because once you know what product you're using then you'll be able to know the rate because each product has got a different rate to give you that per acre or one liter per acre equivalent. We were always trained with uh, glyphosate to spray you know a lot of the products at a half liter or a liter per acre and now when you go into different concentration in grams per liters, that rate per acre, is, uh, it changes to, uh, depending on the product you're using to get that one liter equivalent. Um, other things to watch for is the rain fastness because a lot of the other product, a lot of products have different rain, rain fastness as well as some products are serviced and some products aren't serviced. And just an example of what I was talking about, if you look at a product like Roundup Weather Max, it comes in a 540 grams per liter concentrate and it's got a K salt in it. Uh, it's one liter equivalent, so the one liter per acre that we normally would have used is, is because it's a 540 grams per liter is 0.67 liters. You know, therefore one jug 
pool, which you know usually we talk of 10 liter jugs. Uh, one jug will treat 15 acres at the one acre equivalent rate. And you know, so there you go. And so instead of you know thinking that that jug is going to treat 10 acres, all of a sudden we get 15 acres at the one liter equivalent. Um, it has different registrations for post harvest. Uh, uh, Roundup Ready uh, canolas, uh, pre-harvest and, and post-harvest applications. Uh, it's rain fast, this is 30 minutes, and it's a product that Monsanto will service, so if you have issues with it, uh, they will be out there uh, trying to help you solve the problem. I guess whereas you get a, a product like Credit 45, which is a 450 grams per liter concentrate, it's made using an IPA salt. Uh, it's one liter equivalent rate is about 0 0.8 liters, uh, 0 .0, 0 0.8 liters. Therefore, one jug will treat 12 and a half acres uh, at one liter equivalent rate. You know, so there we go. We go from a, a 10 liter jug in the past doing 10 acres to with Weathermax doing 15 to with Credit doing uh, 12 and a half, and to get that one liter equivalent. So that's where the uh, the concentration is definitely something you need to be watching for. It's registered for pre-seed and for Roundup Ready's and post-harvest, uh, pre-harvest and post-harvest. Post -harvest. It's rain fast, this is one hour, so again you've got the, the half hour difference there and, and it is serviced by New Farm. So New Farm is someone that would come out and, and work your, through your problems. Some of the products that I mentioned that have most service are, are basically you're using those products and uh, you're on your own with them. Put this slide in as to uh, always refer to the guide for crop protection for uh, your weed control and your rates. And if you look in uh, the new book, it's on page uh, 53 and 54 this year. And it's just a breakdown of some of the harder to kill weeds, weeds that we we'll probably uh, spend a lot of our time doing either a, a pre-seed on or a post-harvest on or a pre-harvest on. To, uh, to get control of and uh, it's got a good breakdown of what you need to, uh, what rates you need to be going at, uh, whether it be the low rate or the high rate to get control of these products. So there's uh, definitely some, uh, some good uh, reference material in the crop production guide uh, to uh, help you determine the, uh, the rates you should be going at. A little bit about top-up products. Um, as we uh, look at some of the harder to kill weeds or some of the, uh, you know, the, the, the resistant weeds that are starting to show up as well as trying to control some Roundup tolerant crops. We've gotten into top up products and uh, I guess one of the biggest thing is know what can be sprayed ahead of cereals, oil seeds, uh, pulses, etc. Uh, when you, before you start uh, spraying, especially if you're doing a, a pre-seed spray. Uh, an example, you know, uh, you can spray pre-pass ahead of wheat, uh, you know, but uh, you definitely want to be, you know, using clean start or something like that ahead of canola. Uh, heating glyphosate uh, ahead of peas. You know, some products will leave a residual that will, will damage uh, the crop or the, the crop you might be planning on seeding. So make sure the product you're using is safe for the crop you're planning on, on, on seeding that year. And think about some of the residues that uh, the top-ups are going to give you, uh, especially if you're doing some fall applications of products. Um, what you sprayed last fall might determine what you can seed on those crops this, this spring. And, uh, you know, some of the ones are the, uh, the expresses, the, uh, the bambles, those type products that have a long enough residual that they will affect uh, the, the spring crops growing. And we ran into... Uh, Quite a few of those problems in the past where producers have done a, had a weed problem in the fall and one of the great ways of, you know, great ways of getting rid of it would be to throw a top up in there with, with the glyphosate and then later on in that spring, I remember an example where a producer went out and sowed sunflowers into a field where he had applied banvil in the fall and, uh, and basically ran into problems with, uh, with the residue factor and the and sunflowers not making it uh, making it through but then dying off and uh, and then we got looking into what he had sprayed last fall and uh, sure enough it was something that caused a had a residue that affected the, uh, uh, the sunflowers. Okay. 
So some of the things that for your for pre-seed weed control, and that's I guess one of the things that we're going to be heading into here right away is scout your fields uh, early in the spring to determine what would be the best time for spraying. And I think that's going to be important because we're going to have uh, a lot of uh, a lot of things germinating really fast once the soil warms up. We're actually going to have some canola coming up here fairly soon that's, uh, that was uh, uh, put over last fall, whether it be through the swap or, or through the combine, and those ones are going to be going fast. And we've got the moisture, so if we get some heat, those crops are going to grow fast. The biggest key, and like I mentioned at the start, is apply the herbicides when the weeds are young and actively growing. The quicker you can get them out of the uh, out of the picture for your crop that's going to you're planting and growing, uh, the the more time that crop has to take advantage of the nutrients that you apply to the soil, as well as not have to compete against other weeds, um, and uh, and to uh, to get going. Uh, if you are spraying, avoid spray drift. I think that's a common one. I guess it was just always to try to avoid spray drift into adjacent crops or fields. As we get into seeding here and, and burn offs, uh, we're going to be, uh, you know, some crops are going to be coming up, some crops are still going to be planted, so we're going to need to definitely watch the drift. Use an add in product with a view of it to increasing the glyphosate effectiveness and, effectiveness and not or providing residual control. I guess there what we're saying is, is, is with the, if you have a weed that's going to be a problem, you may have to use a top-up product. Make sure that the top-up product you're using is going to increase the effectiveness of the glyphosate in controlling that weed. Recropping restrictions, always you know watch that. I discussed that. Uh, and I guess the other thing is as we get into more uh, weeds uh, that are starting to show some, some resistant issues, it's uh, maybe not a bad idea to start looking at using multiple groups of herbicides to reduce the risk of the resistance. And you could do that through your burn off in the spring or your, your, uh, your uh, post harvest uh, applications to do uh, weed control in the fall. That gives you a good opportunity to get into some of these other groups that we don't use a lot of anymore and try to control some of the uh, weeds that way. I guess with that, uh, Linda, I, uh, I don't have anything else to, uh, to talk. Go ahead, sorry. Um, I just have a comment uh, from Todd Drummond. He's one of our uh, chemical reps, and he has a reminder that partner tank mix with glycosate is registered as well in front of canola. Okay, no, that's great. Thanks, Todd. And uh, I guess uh, I guess if there's, there isn't any um, other questions. Uh, we'll uh, once again. Here's the slide where uh, it's our contact information. So as John mentioned earlier on in the webinar, that uh, uh, if you have uh, some uh, wireworms or cutworms that you want to get in on that survey, this is a way of getting a hold of myself or Linda uh, regarding the credits for uh, CCA and uh, the Certified Crop Science Consultants. Uh, if you're wanting those. Uh, get a hold of Linda and her information is right there. Uh, John had mentioned the FDAs in the Southwest and South Parkland, so there's Elmer's and Amir's contact information and Andrea Berthlett, who's our environmental person out of, out of Verdon. And here's the crops team or the FDA team for uh, Southwest Manitoba, or for Manitoba. So if you're in any of the other regions and you need to get a hold of an FDA, in crops to help you with any of your questions, uh, get a hold of any of these people, and we're sure that we could uh, help you find out or solve your problems. With that, just to show you that evolution really is weird, uh, I don't have anything else to uh, uh, say for today, so I think if there's no other questions, I think we'll end it there. <laughs>